everyone, Alex the Rat here, and I know this video is a bit late, but the other video I was gonna make ended up facing some difficulties. So uh, while that video is on the back burner for now, uh, let's talk about so called Half Life, which is uh, celebrating its 25th anniversary this year. It's hard to believe that this game is 25 years old given just how much it changed everything really so that's really what I want to talk about today just this game and how it impacted me yeah just let's let's just talk about Half-Life because why not it's it's a good time for it so it is hard to believe that this was Valve's first game because before that they worked at Microsoft uh, Gabe Newell and Mike Harrington started Valve after leaving Microsoft and this was their first game and it's kind of insane to think that a company's first game would change so much, but yeah. So right from the get-go, what really set Half-Life apart was noticeable like the moment you started the game. Because it started very unlike other shooters of the time, like if you look at sh shooters like Quake, Doom, even Sin which came out the same year, they all start with the action right away, like you're just thrown into it and right away you're finding bad guys and stuff but Half-Life decided to do something different what makes it stand out is the fact that it doesn't throw you into the action right away instead it starts with world building and puts you literally into the shoes of the protagonist and that's one of the things that Half-Life did very differently is that it sort of combined story and gameplay whereas previously like story was more in the background like it was in the manual or like cutscenes or some text maybe in some games you would find story bits in like audio logs and stuff but in Half-Life the story happened around you that was made clear from the moment you started the game you got this exposition like delivered to you from just the announcer system on the tram ride and Immediately you notice that this is not a cutscene, like you're allowed to walk freely here, like this is just what's happening, like you're just experiencing what the protagonist is experiencing. And the game never deviates from that, it constantly keeps you in the shoes of uh, Gordon Freeman, the protagonist, and if, if there's anything happening outside of your view, you won't know about it. And even once you're done with the tram rides, the game still doesn't really get started with any like big heavy action or anything. You just start at your regular work day. And I remember playing this uh, back in the day and I was like immediately pulled into this game in a way that very few other games had back then. Like you're just invited into this world and exploring it and sort of getting grounded into it before the game throws you into the deep end. But of course, things uh, inevitably don't really end well. It's a very old trope uh, with man fucking around and finding out and signs going wrong. Like we've seen that as recently as Stranger Things and even the back rooms where horror happens because humanity does something incredibly stupid and we all have to pay a price for it. It's an old trope, but it's a trope that works because it feels like you can just do a lot with that. And Half-Life definitely pulls it off in a way that, again, was very fresh back then. Because what sets it apart is that it, it isn't other people doing it, you're literally there doing it yourself. Like, you're the one putting that sample into the residence chamber, and when everything goes wrong... It feels like it's your own fault, <laughs> like you caused this and making, like putting that amount of responsibility on the player is himself, that was unheard of back then, like usually the bad guys would be the ones causing the big explosion, like in Doom, the USC were to blame for the experiments and demons coming through and you were just trying to cover up their mess, but here, you're part of it. Like, you're causing it, and that was the big thing. That changed everything. So I remember the first time I played Half-Life, when I when you come back from that sequence, I thought I had lost the game. I thought I had messed something up. But no, the game just kept playing. And instantly, I was sort of in this uh, world where I had caused 
everything that went wrong. But it just kept going. And uh, yeah, that's when I understood that's what that's what was meant to happen. And the game doesn't tell you this. And it just happens around you. And it's so immersive and so well done. But yeah, that's pretty much all you need to know in terms of story. Because yeah, like I said, the gameplay and the story are sort of the same thing here. Because you unfold the story as you play the game just naturally by talking to characters and seeing what happens around you and scripted events and stuff so really um if i describe the story more i would just have to describe the game itself and yeah if you're familiar with half-life at all you know that's just how it goes and that's how they it went in the sequel as well but yeah we can get to that later but as for half-life one yeah there's not much to say other than this is just how the game plays so it doesn't really do a whole lot new in terms of controls and stuff, like it, it still plays like a shooter of the 90s. So what's groundbreaking about it is just that it has all these scripted events happening around you and uses that to tell the story instead of, you know, taking the story out of the game. Obviously, another thing that was revolutionary about Half-Life was that it didn't really have levels, so to speak. It, like, you would have transitions into the next part of the game, but it all felt like one seamless level in a way. Like, you were just going from one place to the next, and yeah, the whole experience felt very seamless. There is one point in the game where you get knocked out and have a fade out, and you wake up in a new place, and that's I think that's the only spot in the game where uh, that kind of seamless ride is just broken up. Obviously around this time, like even games like Quake 2 were sort of experimenting with uh, changing up how you proceeded through a game, like Quake 2 would have hub style levels where you just kind of went back and forth and stuff you did in one level would affect stuff in another level. And Half-Life kind of, kind of takes this further, it's still a very linear game, like it, it doesn't really approach levels like Quake 2 in, in that sense. You're still going in one pretty much straight line through the entire game. But the way it progresses is still very different from how a lot of games were done back then. So what I really like about the early parts of Half-Life is how it slowly introduces each enemy to you and sort of just gives you each weapon at a very steady pace. Like, you start out with just a crowbar and a pistol and ammunition is very limited early on so you kind of have to be a bit careful about how much you expend so the game does have a lot of like survival horror elements to it which is also kind of fresh for a shooter back then in terms of weaponry you have pretty much what would be the standard fps loadout back then you had a melee weapon which is the iconic crowbar uh, you have a pistol which is uh, just a glock in the original version i think there was uh, an hd model pack released later on which replaced the glock with a beretta but yeah if you're playing the original game it's a glock uh, there's also a shotgun uh, the spaz 12 which uh, you get later on it's um, actually one of my favorite weapons in the game because it is at close range it can deal a lot of damage especially if you use a secondary fire and yeah that's something in the game does is have alternate fire modes which surprisingly wasn't extremely common back then but some games did it like blood and um, yeah like eradicator like i covered earlier had uh, secondary fire modes as well and half that has this as well where each weapon has a secondary fire which works sometimes very differently from the from the primary Fire. Like, uh, with the shotgun, you can fire either one round or two rounds. And um, firing two rounds at once deals a lot more damage, so it's way more useful against like very heavy enemies and stuff. Once you get to um, a certain point in the game, you also obtain uh, this submachine gun. And um, it becomes a bit of a workhorse weapon in the game, uh, in the sense that it's very versatile for uh, a lot of different enemy types. Obviously not bigger enemies would be hard to take down. It uses the same ammo type as the pistol, so yeah, if you want to conserve on ammo for the SMG, you can just use the pistol instead. So in addition to the regular weapons that I've talked about, you also have grenades, which you can use uh, in some places. I don't really use them much, but they have their uses, especially for uh, certain situations. Combat feels more like a puzzle in this game, so each weapon is just a tool to use for the right kind of situation. And it's kind of up to you to figure out what weapons to use for each combat scenario. 
another element that said Half-Life Apart was how it added some puzzle elements to everything, in that you kind of had to examine the world and do some simple puzzles to progress in some cases. Like, nothing too tasking, but one, one, big, one major example is one of the first bosses of the game. Well, not really a boss per se, but more an obstacle. Uh, the game doesn't really have many bosses, but... Yeah, this one is more of an obstacle that you have to get through. And um, I won't spoil too much about it, but basically you have to um, do a couple things to get rid of it. And yeah, it's, it's, it's very obvious once you get to the boss how to get rid of it, because the game straight up tells you. But just the fact that you don't straight up kill it is very different from how most games would approach a boss like this. Because you can't kill it, it's invulnerable to bullets and explosions, and you pretty much have no choice but to use something stronger. And it just happens to be right underneath a rocket engine, so yeah. The whole point is to just fight the rocket engine, and to do that you need to solve a small puzzle. So this was obviously a game that required you to think a bit more than just mindlessly shooting everything. Speaking of enemies, uh, this game introduces uh, human enemies uh, at some point in the game, which are sent in to uh, clear up uh, what went wrong, and um, they have some of the best AI I've ever seen in a game. Like, they will legit do stuff that you won't see coming, and will act very hard to predict. <laughs> and even now, playing Half-Life, it feels like these enemies are intelligent, and they will sometimes do stupid shit, but that just feel makes them feel organic in a way. If you're trying to be uh, stealthy about it, or trying to use cover, they will force you out of cover by throwing grenades at you, and that level of AI is just unprecedented even today. Obviously this game would go on to inspire a lot of modern games in terms of uh, how the story plays out, like the entire Call of Duty series basically copied the formula from Half-Life by putting you in the middle of everything happening. But I would say Half-Life still remains fairly unique in how it progresses. But yeah, a lot of the time you have to be a little bit like more creative about how you beat certain enemies that just can't be taken down with regular weapons, and that adds a lot to the game. But obviously once uh, you've been through these events before, uh, it's it's a very linear game, and that goes for the sequel as well, like, it's it's just, once you know how to play it, kind of loses a lot of that level of surprise to it. But playing through this game for the first time, you're, you'll definitely feel like you did something. It does make you feel accomplished in the sense that you had to think a bit to get through a problem, rather than just blasting through it. That's not to say the game doesn't have action, like, it has plenty of shooting and gore and stuff, like, class, more typical FPS elements, and there is a ton of that in this game. Now, one thing I want to comment on in terms of the controls is uh, the movement, because some of the movement in this game is, feels very quirky and a little janky, and I think you all know what I'm referencing to, and that is the crouch jump. Um, I'm not sure if Valve hoped that this would become like an industry strand or something, but basically in order to jump up to certain places you have to crouch and then jump, and I think the logic behind it is that you have to pull your feet up, but <laughs> yeah, it feels a bit janky. And yeah, the ladders um, can be a bit tricky to use, especially if you haven't played any Source game before, but you kind of latch onto them and in order to get off them you have to press jump, and it can feel very finicky. <laughs> Of course, graphically, the game is very much a, a product of its time. Um, I wouldn't say it looks amazing or anything, but the lighting is definitely used very well. Before we had stuff like dynamic lighting and real-time lighting. It uses baked lighting mostly, but it looks very good in a lot of places. And another thing I love is that the game has very diverse locations. Like, you're going from a deep underground base to, like, a desert and stuff, and it, it changes things up just enough that it doesn't get too monotonous. And each location feels distinct, like, you can easily remember each specific chapter of this game just based on the location. Of course, I gotta mention the audio being a standout thing about this game, and that, yeah, it, a lot of it is just ambient sound effects and stuff, and it really helps immerse you in the world in the sense it just creates this constant soundscape around you, and this obviously influenced a lot of other games of the time, 
even later, like Doom 3 took a lot of inspiration from Half-Life. The music uh, pops in now and then. Uh, it doesn't always feel like it fits, but it more or less like feels like a movie score in the sense that it kicks in certain times and more so just underscores the action rather than take too much space in a way. That being said, the music is very much in an integral part of the game and I can't imagine the game with any other music than what was made for it. Of course, the standout track is when the game starts and you pick up a hazardous environment suit. Like that theme that kicks in there is iconic and pretty much signals that things are about to change for good. Now I am gonna talk about uh, something that is a bit divisive among fans of this game and that is the final part of the game, the Zen levels. I'm just gonna say that I will get into some spoilers here, so if you wanna skip this part, just go to this time in the video. So I know a lot of people really don't like the Zen levels and feel they drag on a bit too long, but honestly, um, I know this is probably an unpopular opinion, but I this, these are some of my favorite levels in the game, uh, mostly because they kind of feel like nothing else in the entire game, and once you get to the Zen levels, it really feels like you're taken to an entirely different dimension. And you kind of have to just rethink everything about how you approach everything. <laughs> like, what I mean by that is that the game forces you to adapt to a lower gravity. It forces you to adapt to an entirely new level design as well. Like, like Sen is not in our dimension, so everything doesn't make sense to be like how we would usually approach stuff. So the way it's built relies heavily on platforming. And yeah, I can, I can see why people would not like that. But at the same time, once you kind of adapt to how the levels are set up it's not I get, like it's it is annoying because the platforming is a bit finicky but at the same time it is it's just cool that they decided to actually put you in this environment and give you the tools needed to traverse it but also kind of not really hold your hand in any way you're just allowed to sort of adapt to it naturally as you would being in this realm for real, and that just adds to the immersion in my opinion. Now one crucial element about the Zen levels that I absolutely love is not only the fight with the Golnarsh, because this is the only time in the entire series that we get to see where the headcrabs come from. And that is an essential part of the world building right there, like a lot of this lore of the Half-Life universe comes from the Zen levels. Like once you get to the factory for instance, you get to see that the Vorigons aren't hostile. Like, they won't attack you there because they are controlled. And while it's not completely spelled out to you, you can sort of interpret that they are slaves and they are forced to fight you. They don't want to because they are really a peaceful people. But because of, um, yeah, the aliens, they kind of are just forced to fight you and that is a very crucial part of the lore that are presented here in the sand levels. Like, you don't find this out until you get to this point. And yeah, I think a lot of people kind of ignore that when they say the sand levels are the weakest part of the game. I really disagree with that because a lot of the most important lore in the Half-Life universe is presented in these levels. And I, I really don't think that should be overlooked. And really, like, they don't drag on more than other chapters in the game, like, I, I can completely understand wanting to get to the final boss at this point, but at the same time, I really love exploring this kind of alien landscape and this completely alien geometry and stuff, and it just feels like going to a place that you may have seen in a dream somewhere and forgotten about, and I love that feeling. It feels very similar to playing Quake, in the sense that it doesn't make realistic sense, but it makes total sense when you play it. <laughs> um, kind of like having a dream where once you think about the dream it doesn't make sense, but at the time it makes perfect sense, and I love games that bring that feeling to you. So yeah, I guess that's all I have. I guess that's really all I have to say about Half-Life. Like, um, definitely, if you've never played this before, uh, you should go and play the original game. Uh, I know there's a remake 
called Black Mesa. But in order to fully appreciate that remake, um, I really think you should play uh, the original first. And yeah, I will definitely take a look at more games in the series, uh, especially the expansions. Like, we should definitely talk about Opposing Force next, because that is one of the best game expansions ever released, in my opinion. So yeah, we'll get to that eventually. And maybe I'll take a look at the remake as well, Black Mesa. But I will leave you with that. And remember, you can leave a PayPal donation if you want to. That's a good way to support me. And as always, like, subscribe, and all that good stuff. Leave a comment. And yeah, see you later, and take care.